Well, welcome back. We're in uh, week six, lecture two, and here we're going to deal with <clears throat> chapters 19, 20, and, and 21 in the Grudius book. And um, this gets us into more familiar territory. Before we talk about the chapters, let's remind ourselves of where we are. We do have a quiz coming up later this week, so that's uh, something you'll want to have in mind. Y'all are doing pretty well on the quizzes, and so you are uh, to be commended for that. And, um, and this material, as I say, gets us into some areas where we've probably done more reading. If you're a philosophy major, this, what we've covered so far has not been uh, all that difficult. But if you're not a philosophy major uh, and you're a Christian studying apologetics, well, you love the Lord. You love Jesus. And so here he gets us into more of the Christological part of the hermeneutical task and uh, deals with issues like incarnation, resurrection, uh, the deity of the Lord, and uh, and so those sorts of things. Now, before I jump into this, I wanted to mention two books. I'd like to mention a lot more, but we only have time in these lectures to be uh, fairly brief about this. But this book, Jesus Under Fire, edited by Wilkins and Moreland, is a very helpful book that deals with uh, apologetic issues related to Jesus. And so it has chapters by a variety of different people, that's in a series of books that deal with something under fire, whether it's God under fire or hell under fire, a title that I've always found kind of interesting. And uh, <clears throat> so I would commend this book to you. It's a few years old, but it's still very helpful. And then a book that I read uh, during my seminary days, this book right here by I. Howard Marshall, I'll get his whole name in down at the bottom, I Believe in the Historical Jesus. Uh, this is a, was part of a series back in the 70s and early 80s that was called I Believe. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the doctrine of revelation. I believe in humanity. Uh, I believe in creation, so on. So a number of books that, that came out. And this is by uh, Howard Marshall. Howard was a very, very prominent uh, Greek New Testament scholar, or I should just say New Testament scholar, who taught at Aberdeen in Scotland for many, many years. Uh, one of his big claims to fame has been the number of American students who have taken PhDs under him. And those include people like Craig Blomberg, or a friend of mine teaching at Southwestern Seminary, Terry Wilder, um, the, uh, the Greek basic Greek book by Mounts. Mounts was a student of uh, <clears throat> Howard Marshall's also had a chance to meet him a few years ago, but he passed away just recently. But So that's kind of supplemental to the biography right there. In, uh, in chapter 19, he deals with the question of Jesus and the historical evidence for Jesus. And he takes this historical evidence. Uh, by the way, this is a chapter written by Blomberg. And so it's kind of, kind of unusual for a man to write a whole book, but then to allow one or two other scholars to take up a chapter or two here or there, I think shows a good example of Grudius's humility. He probably could have written this chapter as well as Blomberg, but Blomberg, since this is his field, he's a little more sensitive to nuancing and those kinds of issues, and I think that uh, Grudius, who was a co colleague of Blomberg at Denver, Denver Seminary, Denver Baptist Seminary, uh, wanted to bring him in for this part. He starts with the Apostle Paul and then moves on to the New Testament Gospels, uh, makes some words of defense of the, of the Synoptic Gospels, talks about a number of issues such as authorship and date, literary genre, <clears throat> authorial intent, um, compositional procedures that were used by the Gospel authors, and... Uh, fairly long section here where he deals with the historical Jesus in terms of evidence from the first century of Jesus being who he claimed to be. Uh, then he will move on to uh, other subjects such as syncretistic evidence. Now, syncretism is simply a word that means bringing together two or more disparate things. Uh, and it's a common word to, to be used in philosophy of religion, say. Uh, you will hear about people who claim to be Buddhist Christians or Christian Buddhists. 
and um, that's the sort of thing that syncretism deals with. And so what what Blomberg is doing here in Grudius's book is not so much dealing with that aspect of syncretism, but showing how some not completely orthodox um, Christian people in the centuries following Jesus, two or three centuries following Jesus, lent uh, their own particular perspective on this, a perspective that sometimes is acceptable and uh, other times is not lost, is not. There are a number of places in this chapter where you will be uh, reminded of what Blomberg wrote in his book on defending the New Testament documents that we read early or this semester. Talks about miracles and the resurrection and the enduring six, the enduring importance of the historical Jesus. Now, he doesn't get into incarnation here at this point. I think that Grudius had a plan for Blomberg only dealing with these sets of issues because Grudius will deal with the incarnation in chapter 21. Chapter 20 begins with a quote from Dorothy Sayers, very interesting quote. My, maybe one of those things, if you're a keeper of quotes that you'd like to write down in a notebook somewhere uh, and look back to from time to time. Dorothy Sayers was uh, a woman who was an intellectual. She was a, she was a fictional author. Uh, she sort of hung around in the circles of uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, George uh, Williams, and people like that. And so, uh, but she was a, an Orthodox Christian, nonetheless, has a whole book dealing with the question of the Incarnation. Then Grudius talks about the virginal conception and the birth of Jesus. This phrase, virginal conception, may be new to some of us, but it actually is the more preferred term. Uh, as a systematic theologian, primarily by training and by teaching emphasis, uh, this is something that I know uh, and was exposed to many years ago, that even though the virgin birth is important, the really important issue was, was Mary a virgin at the point of conception? That's the big issue. And uh, there's a good little discussion there. The, the baby Christ in the manger. And he deals with Jesus as a master teacher, his basic worldview. That is his views of God, humans, and ethics. And this, uh, the ethics of Jesus thing is becoming increasingly important uh, as we try to disciple a generation of young people who are bombarded by ethical concerns from every other direction imaginable all around them. Uh, Jesus as a miracle worker is part of this, and Jesus as master exorcist, I would uh, in I encourage you to read the books of Graham Twelfth Tree. Twelfth Tree is just like it sounds. And uh, he's done some work in this area that's been quite helpful. The authority of Jesus, uh, the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, which is really the key issue here. <clears throat> and then the death of the Lord and how that contributes to our understanding of him as the only source for hope and life uh, and light in the world. Um, he gets back to this issue of other Jesus and his relationship to other kinds of religious leaders. Was he a sage? No, he was a savior. Was he an avatar? No, he was the incarnation. Was he a prophet? Well, he was, but more than that, he was Messiah. And so chapter 20, uh, I think, is very helpful in laying out some of those issues. Then chapter 21, defending the incarnation. There's a lot of background here that he doesn't have time to go into, but I'll give you just a snippet of perspective on it. And some of this material would come from the book by Marshall, I believe in the historical Jesus, if you want to go that far and dig that deeply uh, into these issues. In the middle of the 19th century, there was a move afoot uh, to incorporate a history of religions understanding uh, with a biblical interpretation. And by that, it simply meant syncretism, we've talked about briefly already, and incorporating elements of other ancient theologies into the Christian uh, understanding of the Bible and of Jesus in particular. And uh, so David Friedrich Strauss, who was a, an independent scholar, but quite a prolific one in Germany during that time, uh, wrote a huge book dealing with Jesus as myth and myth maker. Uh, 
and uh, that idea <clears throat> carried on to some degree to a lesser interpretation in people like Schleiermacher and Albert Rischel and uh, uh, others like that in the mid to, mid to late 19th century, brought up again by Rudolf Bultmann in the 20th century, uh, who, inter who basically interpreted incarnation or resurrection in kind of a preacher sense. That is, he saw them as myths, but as myths that had a basic idea, and the basic idea is now communicatable in terms of existentialist philosophy. That as Jesus was born of a virgin, so out of our lives we can find rebirth. And so if, some, if you ever hear anybody sort of talking about that, uh, they have probably been influenced by Bultmann, or more likely influenced by, by somebody who was influenced by somebody who was influenced by Bultmann. Uh, competing views of Jesus as they're presented right here. And by the way, back to that incarnational issue, it flared up again in 1977 with a book published by a number of British authors called The Myth of God Incarnate. And that book really came out during my seminary years, and that book really did challenge New Testament scholars to take a look at whether or not Jesus is a mythological figure or not. And at the root of this, in their view, was the incarnation. Once establish the incarnation, and Jesus is suddenly unique. And I think that that is exactly right. No other major religious figure claimed to be an incarnation. They were avatars, or they were sages, or they were prophets, or they were gurus, or something else. Uh, then he has a short section, but very interesting, on the rational coherence of the incarnation. Uh, the Incarnation seems to be a logical impossibility. Uh, Kierkegaard once said, I believe in the Incarnation because it is absurd. But what he is at pains to do here is to show us that that absurdity is not there. Then, Metaphysics of Incarnation, appealing to several British scholars uh, in particular as he deals with those issues. Well, uh, in the final lecture for this week, we're going to look at Scott Oliphant's three chapters where he deals also with Jesus, somewhat of a different way, but we'll deal with that when we come to it.